A very good uh, morning to you all. Uh, I am Vishu Srivastu and uh, I am uh, talking on paradigms of materials and process design. Uh, in this uh, presentation, uh, we will be basically uh, uh, looking at the developmental stages of materials as well as processes uh, right from the uh, ancient times and the modern era and the era in which we are living at present. So uh, we'll go through this as well as uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, we will uh, see that what do we require at present uh, to do uh, to, uh, to get more and more uh, insight into the materials and process, new materials and process discoveries. This is what the aim of this uh, presentation is. And uh, before we go ahead, let us first see, start understand uh, what is what are materials and processes. Uh, in the in the picture you are looking at, uh, we have raw materials for uh, food, where we have. Uh, cereals, uh, we have spices as well as uh, we have vegetables. Uh, these are the raw materials for our food. And from the raw materials to food, uh, in between we uh, process the raw materials and we can say we cook it. And finally, we get the food we eat. Now, uh, food is a product from the raw materials, but we uh, we, uh, we take the, these are the ingredients. Now, uh, what about the product, whether, whether it is acceptable to you uh, as a, a customer or not? How do you decide how the ingredients processed and that give rise to a thali of food for you? And do you like it or not? How do you decide it? So, uh, the decision on whether this serves your purpose is determined by several factors and these are how tasty is the food, uh, uh, what health condition I have, how much time it takes to prepare, what is the cost of the material, uh, what is the nutrition uh, content in this, how is it is presented, what is my age group, what is the aroma of the uh, food? So all these things uh, determine uh, all this perception of we as a con consumer uh, determines whether the product of the food in my thali is really satisfactory for me or not. So that means uh, the product is a combination of the raw materials as well as how we process and cook. So in a way we can say that uh, our uh, uh, satisfaction with the product, it depends upon my perception of what I want from the product as well. And that will be governed by the raw materials what, you, what we use and how this raw material is processed to make a product. So what uh, I can, uh, uh, say is that uh, the product has to be taken in totality considering the raw materials as well as the processes and the aim of the raw material and the process is to give a product which satisfies certain kind of perception hmm, uh, of the consumer or the stakeholder. So this is how uh, I understand the materials and processes. Uh, and if we go to the engineering material design, so we can say that we know three different kinds of uh, materials that is metal, ceramic and polymer. And uh, uh, they are they have some composition and uh, they are processed in certain manner. And the <coughs> structure, uh, which is the culmination of the composition and processing, 
determines the property and that property gives us the performance and this performance is decided by again the consumer. Uh, in the left side, you can see that there is a child doing some scientific exercise and uh, this is how uh, a scientist takes the ingredients, these ingredients process and reach to certain properties and uh, properties of the material which again is seen by uh, the people and uh, if they find that uh, the material is performing well uh, and suited to their uh, purpose, then they can use it. Or if I have some performance in my mind and then I want to decide what should we do, what uh, kind of material we should uh, use, what processing I should do to get that performance, then we go to the data and again go back. Uh, uh, to see how we have to uh, uh, do the uh, processing for which material, what property do we want, like that. So a scientist uh, goes uh, from top to bottom as well, but uh, an, an engineer, he goes from uh, bottom to the top uh, to find out what is the material, how to process, and then, but that is based upon the data we, uh, we see, uh, data uh, collection we have uh, for different materials. Uh, now we go to evolution of the engineering materials. So this is the HB map, uh, it's commonly known. And uh, from the left side, uh, we are in this region, if you see, uh, the uh, 10,000 BC, uh, what have used to happen? What is the importance of different materials mm, in uh, prehistoric times? So you can see the all the naturally uh, occurring materials were more important because that time metal material metals were not available to us. But slowly gold, copper, bronze, iron, these were found and the importance of metals increased slowly with time and that is because uh, they had a strength, uh, there was a possibility to increase uh, a strength as well as the formability of these materials. And then uh, slowly the metal uh, importance increased. But uh, from 1950s, 1960s, uh, you are able to see uh, that the polymers, composites, and ceramics, the importance of these things increased. And the, the importance of metal decreased. And this because uh, we, uh, from 1950s, uh, all we can say is uh, in the last century, uh, in totality, uh, the work on metallic materials uh, is very nominal. And this is just some slight changes in composition and the processing, uh, just incremental uh, changes we were doing. Uh, and uh, metallic materials are mostly uh, used for the structural application, but polymers, composites, and ceramics, they have many functional applications. And in the technological development, functional metal properties are one of the most important the parameters uh, to decide. This is why there was an increase uh, in this uh, in these materials importance for the human society. Okay. Uh, now uh, in the next slide, uh, so uh, why it uh, so happened? Because uh, in the ancient times naturally occurring materials were easily available and so that was used for the benefit of the mankind. Uh, but as the metals uh, were discovered and so this discovery led to a lot of innovations and uh, the mankind used this material for the intense requirement with the strength and formability. And later on, as the <coughs> Uh, in the last uh, 50 years of the last century, 
the technological technological advancement in the uh, composite ceramics and polymers lay, uh, led to the more and more importance for these materials particularly due to their functional uh, properties here are a few uh, uses of uh, materials for example in, in pottery they use this uh, brass they use these are the uh, hut this is the hut where the uh, these are the components basically mud and the straw so uh, composite uh, they might not uh, have known the science behind it but uh, they use composites these are the tools and these are the stone tools so we can say that people were very innovative that time also and they used to uh, 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 benefit and they used to innovate from the uh, materials whatever they had uh, at their disposal so next slide if you see that uh, in the prehistoric times uh, these are also the mfsc maps so what he has tried is uh, uh, he has tried to uh, see strength and density of the materials and he made large number of clusters like uh, metallic clusters ceramic and glasses as well as natural materials uh, not only these clusters he has uh, defined many other clusters uh, with different uh, uh, properties for example uh, strength and elongation modulus and density conductivity resistivity with the strength all those uh, clusters he has made this is just to show uh, that uh, how the strength and density uh, landscape uh, change with time so here we can say the see that uh, in the prehistoric time these were the materials available but uh, as uh, we came to the uh, last of the last uh, uh third millennium then what happened that you can see that uh, uh, the cluster of metals increase instead of gold there is silver bronze iron uh, copper lead all these things came in in the cluster of metals and similarly ceramic and glasses that became the concrete bricks all those uh, materials came in and natural uh, materials there was copper wood and pine all those materials that came and they came in but uh, further advancement if you look at then came the steels uh, aluminum alloys tin uh, zinc all this came in that cluster increasing the possibility uh, within the metallic clusters so uh, the possibility of more and more uses of metals increased and but uh, for the ceramics and polymers uh, in that time uh, it was not very very uh, large but uh, people uh, i think were working uh, in this direction also uh, in the present day you now if you look at the the cluster of metals has increased tremendously and uh, see a same thing happened with the ceramics so metals and ceramics they developed a lot and here if you see polymers and elastomers elastomers you can see this also came in so large development uh, was seen in polymers and elastomers where you can have uh, crpf uh, the composites silicon elastomers all those things so the this cluster also increase in size giving more and more possibilities where metals and ceramics could not be used uh, and one very important thing uh, which came in is foams light materials where so the density was very less though strength was also less but this material is not actually the even in naturally occurring or the metals and ceramics the density of these materials were very low uh as well as the strength but they had some use uh, uses or application in different areas so we can see the whole lot that filled in with time so what it uh, what actually happened is 
the mankind uh, the innovative minds of the people they wanted to fill this space more and more to increase the possibility of materials hmm, for their use and for the betterment of their life and this is what this is how development took place but uh, if you look at uh, this area uh, now uh, nowadays what people are thinking is how to reduce the density at the same time increase the strength so we have this hole still existing and for this uh, purpose uh, new developments are being done but the other possibility is uh, that just say for the metals uh, we do have already uh, uh, available materials and their properties and we can find an application for this but even then uh, even whatever cluster i have uh, in this also a uh, lot of uh, developments are going on for example uh, if you go to uh, next one uh, this is uh, elongation and tensile strength diagram for steels so where you can see and uh, these are the different uh, material uh, different steels where in some cases for if steel elongation is very high but the strength is low similarly for martensitic steels strength is very high but the elongation is not there so uh, what happened there is a trade off between elongation and the tensile strength i, I mean the strength and the permeability so uh, this is the first generation of steel and the next one is the second generation where uh, we did get very high strength as well as the ductility but these were uh, highly alloyed so highly alloyed materials uh, were, were difficult to process in the steel industries uh, and uh, this is why we went to a third uh, generation of steel in this range so what people are trying to do is uh they want strength also uh so that the specific uh, strength increases for a material uh basically for automotive application and many more other applications also and at the same time increase the elongation okay so what uh, i am trying to uh, emphasize here is uh, people are trying to increase the strength as well as the formability now uh, not only uh, the scientific uh, uh, investigation is on third generation uh, steel but also uh, people are trying to see what is the fundamental aspects of increase, uh, fundamental as aspects and the control of the microstructure by which one can uh, increase the strength and ductility trade off so in that case what happened we know that uh, in the composites we have uh, grains as well as uh, different phase bond phases this is just say fcc phase this is bcc phase there is a phase boundary that we know that this affect the properties then there were grain boundary so increased amount of grain boundary led to better strength and ductility but nowadays uh, it's a recent uh, investigation uh, they found that within within the grain also if you have uh, some change in concentration in for the same phase but different compositions then uh, the dislocation moment is hindered and you can have more uh, Uh, ductility so and uh, <coughs> these are the intrinsic material development but as you saw in sb map that there are different kinds of uh, materials ceramics polymers metals foams but uh, what happens that if these material the properties of these materials are uh, brought together and for that purpose uh people had been using hybrid materials hybrid materials where you can make composites from polymer metals polymer ceramics 
and uh, this is a component of aluminum and silicon carbide for example you can make sandwiches of different materials polymer metal ceramics all those here what i show here is a sandwich of uh, nickel and aluminum uh, you can make foam sandwiches like that you can make lattices where you have a composite of lattices with uh, i can say air and then there are segmented structures where you have different uh, segments of different materials okay uh this is just uh, one example of uh, architecture materials people are trying to do uh, nowadays uh, where this is a solid material and a topological uh, optimization you can do means uh, what is the best way uh, to uh, take some materials out from here even then you are not compromising with many of the other properties so this is called topological optimization then Uh, you can decrease the uh, density uh, and even then uh, you get the properties what you desire and some microstructural changes means uh, you have the possibility of uh, mixing the possibility of mixing the uh, different lattice structure for example fcc lattice scp lattice bcc lattice all those th things can be joined together in one material and uh, you can see the difference what is uh, happening so uh, uh, what uh, in in total total totality you can say that uh, these are basically the architecturing of the available materials according to uh, the uh, naturally occurring materials so we have to see we, we call it biomimicry where the material occurring naturally can be mimicked in a new uh, fa in a, in a fashion what uh, material we have at our disposal uh, so this is how uh, uh, new hybrid materials or functionally gated materials can be developed here you can see that uh, the uh, <coughs> This is young modulus versus density, and here you can see this one is for composites, for aluminum forms. Uh, this is the uh, cluster. But uh, if you make lattices uh, of this, just say lattice structure. If you have this is forms, but this is lattice structure. So you have optimized. Someone has optimized these properties in such a way that for a given density, the modulus. is increasing so this is a totally with a given material you can design the you can architect the uh, system uh, uh, so that the young modulus uh, increases uh, so uh, here the, you can see that uh, you can architecture the material in the form of lattices to increase the young modulus of the material so there is a possibility <coughs> now uh, we go to the next slide where uh, i just wanted to say that uh, we have seen different kinds of materials which is uh, uh, which has been developed by the people by the uh, and the databases of, of these materials are available but in 2004 there was a new material developed uh, was observed uh, we call it high entropy alloys so the philosophy uh, behind high entropy alloy is uh, that uh, if you look at uh, uh, the tetrahedron then most of the alloys we have seen up to now uh, was basically uh, designed by one principal element a b or c or d and other elements were in very in, in a small amount so as the other elements also increase in amount the structure the microstructure what we used to get uh, were not very uh, encouraging but uh, in 2004 uh, some of the scientists they saw that uh, if we go to this region uh, which was not explored earlier where uh, the 
elements were uh, in uh, almost in the center of that uh, uh, composition space. Uh, almost uh, equal amount of uh, different elements. Then uh, they saw that there was a, a there was a different structure all together, and they were actually uh, beneficial in terms of uh, properties uh, uh, as well both structural as well as functional properties. Uh, here you can see that. Uh, uh, the elongation and extensile strength, strength. We try to combine those things, and you can see, and in, in this uh, zone, that is subzero temperature properties, high elongation as well as high strength. You can see is available with us, and uh, very uh, super plastic materials also you can achieve using uh, high entropy alloys. So, and these materials are actually. Uh, better compared to other, you see, this is austenitic stainless steel and DP steel. So, HEA can be one of the most important uh, materials uh, in the times to come, which can serve our purpose with uh, more elongation and strength. But the problem is uh, the, uh, the difficulties is the with increase. Uh, is so many materials, so many elements coming together uh, and uh, uh, giving different properties. So the total composition space for such a large number of elements increases. So how to find the most suitable composition and process for a given alloy that becomes a difficult proposition and this product difficulty has to be solved. Many of people they are trying it by computational techniques as well as uh, high throughput technique and still uh, by uh, machine learning for example, artificial intelligence, but the data available for these materials are, these are the new materials are very less. So uh, there is a possibility that we have to work more and more on these alloys so that we can have generate more and more data to make it easier for the discovery of new alloys and systems. Uh, now we have talked about the materials. Uh, now we are going to see what are the factors affecting a product. For example, uh, we have a material for example, and then uh, uh, we know that what are the functions we want it to uh, fulfill. So we know the functions, we know the material, and we, uh, from engineering point of view, we know the shape. Well, uh, in which shape do you want to you want the material to be? And for that shape, what kind of uh, process uh, uh, to be used? So materials, function, shape, and processes, uh, they are uh, the combine. They give the combined effect uh, in making a product, but. Uh, while processing and shaping the material, we should be careful uh, of the structure and property. So the structure and property of the final product what you get in a given shape to serve a given function of a given material composition made by a process should be satisfactory. So uh, all these things have to be considered uh, for uh, development of a product. So materials we have already talked about, now we will talk about processes. Uh, so uh, all the materials what we have uh, known till date, uh, they are generally uh, arranged in such a manner that for example, different kinds of materials are there, ceramics, glasses, metals, polymers, elastomers, habit materials even. So, if you want to search for metals, for example, uh, of a class of a steel or copper alloys, aluminum alloys, titanium alloys, mm. and uh, then you go to a subclass, uh, which kind of aluminum, which aluminum alloy, 1000 series, 2000 series, 3000 series, which uh, subclass of material do you, uh, you want? And from 6000 series, what is the member series of uh, member in uh, this series, for example? Uh, 
6013 or 6061 which alloy do you want and what is the property of these materials so having the documented uh, material properties of a given material they can choose what material whether this material is suited for a given application but uh, the point is uh, the data with the materials is tremendous uh, how to select a material obviously uh, simple human uh, intervention cannot work so the computational interventions are required uh, in uh, screening the data is screening the material data uh, what are the properties they have so this is what has to be done and similarly uh, there are arrangements for process also in the process we shape the materials shape uh, shaping can be done by uh, uh, forming application machining applications uh, uh, here just say for example shaping can be done by forming powder methods molding casting all those uh, processes are there uh, joining also we can take up where we uh, uh join by adhesives we join by welding we join by fastening them or we can do some surface treatment uh to get the given the given shape of the surface means what is roughness when it should be polished and there should be printed or something printed on the uh, surface there had to be coating all surface had to be hardened uh like this here in hardening uh, plating etching so many different classes of uh, processing are there now uh, same thing casting for example how many different kinds of casting processes are there and if we choose a die casting process then what are the you know, facilities a die casting process can provide to us so based on uh, so we decide the material first and then we decide what is the process by uh, which could be suited for the material uh, to be made as a product so uh, materials and the process of shaping that counts a lot but uh, but as i mentioned earlier the whatever materials you take whatever processes you take for a given function you have to ensure that the structure and property of the material they are suitable for your application uh, now if you look at the process developments how the process is developed with time so sand casting we know that sand casting is very old technique but there were always a problem i am not going to deal with the problems right now in uh, problems and solutions and the characteristics of different processes but uh, it's just a kind of uh, enumeration of uh, different processes and uh, how they developed sand casting led to die casting die casting was easier and the maintenance was not very uh, uh, big in this and the production rate could have been increased uh, then investment casting uh, came in and after that low pressure casting uh, came in so the all these casting processes they generally gave rise right to a slow cooling rate so the materials uh, were not uh, giving that much a production rate increase no, no doubt but the property property wise they were not that uh, that good so uh, powder metallurgy process started and uh, this powder metallurgy process the uh, Uh, rate of uh, production was very high and the since we we had powders we have fine powders they, then uh, the process was uh, giving very fine structure and this was used for uh, aerospace applications as well as many critical applications then uh, it was realized that uh, powder sintering gave rise to some kind of uh, porosity or inhomogeneity or something like that So, or it cannot be it is difficult to use this material for very high temperature application high temperature materials so came in hot isostatic pressing where material was uh, pressed in isostatic manner this is the powder and around this we had argon gas heated gas and 
uh, uh, the material experienced the uh, and the pressure same pressure at all the different sections but uh, these processes uh, if you look at uh, this aluminum silicon phase diagram then it shows uh, that uh, as you increase the amount of silicon in aluminum uh, the experience shows that uh, if with increase in silicon amount in aluminum uh, the wear properties of the materials increases uh, becomes better but what happens that if you increase it uh, then you can see uh, here if a silicon forms at this place and in the liquid it remains for a very long time and so the silicon once formed they uh, becomes bigger and bigger in size so though a uh, lot of uh, experiments and innovations were done uh, for refinement of uh, silicon in aluminum alloys uh, but uh, th that did not help so <clears throat> then came new processes we call it rapid solidification in rapid solidification there are two ways uh, uh, which are commercially uh, adopted for example high pressure gas automation there we have a liquid and this liquid uh, uh, you atomize using a gas jet inert gas jet and then you get powders and these powders can further be used for making components uh, so powders you uh, the powders what you get here they experience very high cooling rate and due to high cooling rate there is a refinement in microstructure which is not available with the cast material Similarly, there were melt spinning. Melt spinning could be uh, could be done for getting amorphous materials, uh, ribbons, and which can further be recrystallized to get the better uh, strength and properties of materials. But uh, the number of uh, steps from uh, raw material to the product in uh, these processes also were not very uh, very promising. Uh, so, new process is uh, step forming uh, came in uh, in the late uh, 80s, uh, where the powder production process as well as uh, this casting process were combined together. So here you can see uh, there is a melt coming down in a crucible and being uh, optimized using a inert gas jet. And the droplets are formed in a spray uh, cone, and the droplets are being cooled at a very high cooling rate under the uh, under the convective force, convective heat transfer from the gas. And here, the droplets, uh, undercooled droplets, are coming in deposited, and this uh, substrate is being taken down so that the distance between these two points remains same. To give a steady development of microstructure in the deposit. So this is the process uh, uh, used for many of the materials, but the uh, uh, the main effect it gave is the grain refinement, as well as uh, you can use uh, the materials which were difficult to process by cast, uh, casting process. Uh, here is a. This is a photograph of a uh, tool steel being made by spray forming, and here you can see that uh, around 4,000 kg of uh, this material uh, developed uh, in the form of a billet. Uh, and this process uh, could also be uh, uh, could also have an a, a, a variant uh, like uh, gas atomized material is fed. Uh, within two rolls and so during the process the rolling sheet what you get this is refined in microstructure as well as dense similarly you can have impulse automation to make a deposit these are actually the variants of its forming route as i discussed in the previous slide and uh, this is the centrifugal automation this is how uh, uh, the development took place and if you look at the microstructures obtained, this is the as cast material microstructure here. So as cast material, the large size, large size of uh, intermetallic uh, 
uh, intermetallic and this simply cannot be used as a, a, a component in any in application. But with a refined structure, you can uh, uh, the same thing, same material. Uh, now it is refined in such a way you can see after it's performing. And this is the show that uh, how uh, continuous cast material uh, had this structure and by spray forming one can achieve this kind of refined and uniform structure in a, in a material in a billet. Similarly, uh, I, I would say that the other processes like uh, as I talked about the powder metallurgy route, of making components. So uh, here we we try to have a powder forging and rolling technique where you uh, mix the powders, you forge it and then roll it and finally sinter. After sintering, you uh, get foam. Uh, sintering and foaming, you get uh, sandwich foams here. So uh, what uh, I would like to bring to the notice of all of you is that there are processes available. We have to be innovative and with that innovation, a given material can be processed in a different matter, a different manner to get a, a new product. So material process and product, they are such in such a way they are highly related. Uh, but uh, this, uh, these are the uh, data available with us and is it possible that the, uh, in the throughout the world, whatever data uh, data is available in materials as well as the processes can be assessed, uh, assessed and new techniques, new processes or new materials can be developed in a given very small time. So this is the whole purpose of this talk uh, to bring to you that how we can uh, go ahead with that. And these are the some forms we made at uh, our place in the NML. Uh, the new processes, uh, you already know that nowadays metal additive manufacturing has come into picture. Uh, uh, and in the last 10 years, a lot of interest has gone into this and not only in India, uh, Europe and uh, European countries uh, are much more ahead in this. And uh, these processes uh, are the are being sought as the processes of the future, where you uh, you don't have to uh, go for so many different steps of uh, manufacturing as we do in casting and machining processes. Here you can uh, play with the computer and design it, and then finally print something, print something as we desire. So no fasteners, no joining no casting, you get the shape uh, in one go. Anyway, uh, there are issues even now with the uh, additive manufacturing, but the concept uh, is very promising and uh, people are working on in this area and definitely uh, they would, uh, this process is going to take over uh, many of the applicate, many of the uh, uh, process areas and uh, that is the thing we have to be careful about. All the developments, uh, uh, before going into detail, detail uh, let us see what are the products uh, of additive manufacturing. So mainly the products by additive manufacturing is non-load bearing right now. And here you can see the copper heat exchangers, copper alloy uh, inductors, and some different stainless steel, titanium alloys, many aluminum alloys, many of the materials are being used for this, uh, uh, for making, uh, used for by uh, additive manufacturing to make different components. Uh, now, uh, the point is, why these developments? What makes these developments to uh, uh, take place? Why, what is the inequality in this? Whether it is only inequality, inequality in this of people uh, to innovate or there are some other factors which are adding to the developments. Yes, there are. There are market forces, there are perceptive forces. 
uh, there are technological forces, no doubt. So uh, the point is, uh, as we live in a society, what we need and whatever we need, we should get it. And uh, we should give this information, we give this information generally to the market and market the survey, they, uh, they find that what people need. And the moment they find, uh, they want to sell it, to make it and sell it. So uh, once they sell, you will buy. Okay, so between your need and uh, your buying, and there is a lot of conceptual design processes ha happening. So market derive, drives uh, a concept development and these concept developments uh, depends upon uh, what is the technology available, what is the investment uh, possibility, and uh, what kind of aesthetics people want, and what would be the environmental effect if we use that technology to satisfy the need of the people. And finally, considering all those things, uh, uh, the engineers define the specification for a product and produce it to sell it to us. So this is the whole uh, uh, inputs. Uh, these are the inputs for the design process. And that led to basically the four stages of industrial revolution. Uh, we have seen the first, second and third revolutions as uh, the slide shows. Uh, so in uh, today, uh, uh, we have seen the fourth industrial revolution. So in the third one, we uh, uh, went to automation. And in the fourth one, uh, automation is combined with the cyber physical, cyber physical systems. So the human interface is going to go down in this. And the possibility are increasing tremendously. So uh, if there are a lot of possibilities and uh, technological innovations. So what is going to happen? The technology, what we had, we were satisfied with the technological uh, aspects up to now. They are disrupted. Disrupted because uh, whatever we were habit habitual of, that is not going to work now. And then you need to change yourself. And the change is coming and the market where we were working uh, to profit for, that is going to see a trauma. So this says that now and today, uh, due to the, the revolution, the force revolution of uh, in the industry, we have to change ourselves and the change should be coming faster and faster. So next slide, if you look at, uh, this is the Fifth Avenue uh, Street in New York. So uh, can you find a car here? Yes, there is one. But uh, many of the uh, vehicles are horse driven. Now, after, in, after 13 years on the same street, uh, you will not find a horse, horse driven vehicle. So in 13 years, things may change tremendously. That means we should know how to change. We can't stay uh, with the habits we have. So things are changing. And we have seen uh, that in India, the uh, telephone booths uh, are not there at all due to coming of the mobiles. Uh, digital camera came and this uh, uh, film roll and uh, conventional camera, they went off. Now, subtractive manufacturing is to be replaced by additive manufacturing. Now, we had classes and with this pandemic uh, uh, of coronavirus, now online education has started and uh, you, will so, you, will, you will see that in the coming days, in next one, two years, online education will be the norm of the uh, norm. 
So this is how change takes place and we have to be careful with the change. And what the message uh, I would like to uh, give here that uh, it's not the change of the society only, it's a change with our research process also. The discovery of materials and processes, they have to be done faster and faster. Uh, the span from in the span from the uh, lab to the industry for the production mm, should go reduce slowly. It should go down and down. So for that purpose, we have to uh, see that how we can uh, do it. So first of all, uh, we should understand that what kind of relationships uh, exist between the product and uh, the effort to make a product. So uh, the property structure PSPP, that is property structure, uh, process structure, properties and performance relationships. So what you could see there, uh, there are two ways of uh, developing a product. So either you know the performance of uh, you want, and then you start finding what will be the properties required, what will be the microstructure required, and what processes should be adopted for making this. Or you have the processes, you have the microstructure, uh, uh, then you uh, deduce a microstructure, and then you find the properties and you tell people that okay, these properties we have and these can, uh, uh, this material can perform uh, in this manner. So, uh, in one case, uh, we use causes and effect process, that are deductive in inferences, which is called a discovery based methodology, where you use the processes and processes and raw materials uh, to bring in, bring out a new uh, material uh, for a new performance. Uh, but in other case, you may know the performance, you may have a, a lot of data with you on materials and the processes, and you try to uh, optimize uh, the uh, optimize the uh, material and process to give a given uh, performance. So, Optimization and design is uh, a kind of inductive inference uh, process uh, used by engineers. And uh, uh, here the discovery based methodology is used by to predict, to predict the performance uh, of a material uh, what we make. Hmm. That is the uh, task done by scientists. Now, uh, if you have a large number of uh, materials, the universe of materials you have, how to choose a, sl a selected material for your purpose. So here, uh, there are different ways to do it. So you have all the materials. So you define the function of the material, what objectives it has to fulfill, and what are the constraints, for example, uh, uh, whether it has to be used in the corrosive environment or not, like that. So you define the uh, performance objective and then you screen the, all the materials. Uh, screening the materials and uh, to meet all the constraints, you put all the constraints and then try to screen the unwanted uh, materials from there. And then you rank. So you may have, uh, after screening, you may, may have several number of uh, materials available. So you have to rank them according to the excellence where where uh, you you don't have to compromise anything. So uh, that is the first one. First thing, then, uh, and based on the level of compromise you are making with the materials, uh, you rank them first to uh, in order. Then uh, what after getting the material, uh, then you see whether uh, <coughs> the performance history of that material is good or not. If that material in the service, they have performed well, then this is the material. And not only for materials, this process of selection is applicable for the material processing also. 
and uh, this is just an example that uh, for material selection you uh, objectify that uh, it should be a light material for example uh, you want a material light you want high thrust to weight ratio you full fuel efficient low gas and noise well emission low maintenance safe and reliable so this is the objective and the material you require uh, uh, should have these properties. These are the constants. So high temperature modulus should be this, high temperature strength should be this, something like that. And then you go to material data. And from there, you select the material which uh, fulfill these constraints. All these the developments, material selection uh, uh, up to now, uh, were not able, were not considering uh, the effect of uh, the process or material on the environment. So earlier, uh, we used to take the material from the, uh, the take the resources from the earth, used to make the material what uh, we wanted, we used it, and without any concern, we used to dispose it of and pollute the earth. But now the things are changing. So to save our earth, we need to go for circular economy. This is what we call. So you make use, then reuse the material, remake and then recycling. So this is a very important things we have got uh, nowadays with the regulation now. So every time you choose a material and choose a process, we have to address the problem of recyclability and reuse. Uh, what is sustainable development? So the designing uh, material or process for sustainability. So you know uh, that you have to take care of uh, recyclability, the functional properties, how to manufacture it. And these things are so, what is the uh, societal effect? What is the environmental impact? And how to utilize the resources? And what is the effect on economy? So, all these things have to be defined during the process of selection or development of materials and processes. So, sustainable development is defined by uh, uh, Broadland Commission of United Nations and they define it as sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we have very big responsibility uh, uh, of uh, being sustainable for us and for the future generation. Uh, and in this process, <coughs> Uh, we have to look at now uh, what lies ahead. So for centuries, uh, we have been developing new materials and uh, it took a long time because the developmental work took uh, was very based on the trial and error method and um, it used to make the process expensive and slow. So today we need uh, to speed up the process and uh, to save our time and money and this can be developed by great inno inno uh, innovation uh, across many sectors of the economy okay so searching a material and process for the from the vast space is like finding a dot in a big box so you know uh, the different uh, materials are developed and the data is kept somewhere Though some publications are there, some books are there, some data books are there, even then, even then, uh, it is very difficult if uh, a person uh, starts uh, finding a material from this vast space. So we need to have educated guests uh, to find the answer. And uh, this will uh, be done not by normal human mind, but it has to be done by uh, computational techniques by computational techniques 
and this is what is called material informatics and that is going to be the solution uh, in the coming days. So material uh, informatics, uh, if we uh, see it, so there are four paradigms of uh, material development. Uh, in early days, uh, we used to uh, do experiments and uh, by doing experiments, we used to find out uh, uh, what lies inside uh, uh, inside the material of process. So every time we want to know something, we do, need to do experiments. That is called the first paradigm. It is named as empirical science. We used to do, but slowly we developed uh, uh, a technique. Looking at the uh, experiments, uh, we developed some model-based uh, theories. And for example, the thermodynamics and other things. So uh, we work together. So uh, um, experiments and these models experiment uh, together uh, went uh, together to give some more insight in, in developing new theories. Uh, and then we stop because uh, the models, uh, if we go, uh, go to more and more complicated models, then we needed to do a lot of uh, calculations. So these things uh, came in when computers came in and computational sciences uh, supported our work in uh, right from, uh, I should say, 80s, where uh, new techniques were evolved to uh, do more calculations and give the results easily uh, in a shorter time. And also, uh, for example, molecular dynamics and density functional theories theory, uh, they also gave light to uh, new data, new data. They generated new data. So uh, uh, first, second and third paradigm, they actually supported each other in the development of the materials. But now whatever developments we have done, uh, they are there already uh, documented and now the documentation uh, make a very large database with us and this data has to be analyzed and now uh, the, uh, by analyzing this data can we predict can you find a new material can you find uh, the new processes by which uh, we can uh, do the uh, discovery of new materials and processes. So this is the fourth paradigm we are in now, where we have to use the predictive uh, analytics like uh, machine learning uh, or uh, artificial intelligence. These are going to work on the data, data points from the different uh, sources and give us easy way of discovery new materials and processes. So what is the materials design concept? First of all, you uh, take the data from the literature or as well as you do experiments to create the data. But these experiments need to be very uh, fast uh, because uh, uh, you have to create data on all the aspects. For example, uh, um, developing an, an alloy then you have to have different compositions, uh, then properties, then microstructure, then uh, uh, other uh, functional uh, properties. All those things have to be done uh, at a very fast rate. And uh, then you have to do correlation, means uh, you have to use the engines when can make some inferences from the data you provided and then make a theory, physical concept of the system based on the inferences and the data available. And once we get that, then we say that we have a information based materials design. We can do information based materials design now. We are capable of. So that is called an online base created. Now, uh, how we can do that? So we have uh, different computational tools, for example, uh, uh, as we discussed now. Uh, for DFT, molecular dynamics, finite and finite element analysis, and then machine learning, artificial intelligence. These are tools 
uh, and new softwares are also coming uh, for metallurgy uh, uh, <coughs> metallurgical analysis of uh, materials for example uh, deform for processing micras for microstructures uh, something like that and we have thermocal for thermodynamic analysis so these are the computational tools and we do have experimental tools also the facilities to do experiments uh, and both of these can be used to develop extensive digital data and this digital data if we have so all the things combined uh, all the infrastructure combined can give rise to uh, accelerated discovery of new materials and this is the bulk flow for data driven materials discovery so you supply data and new data in this so data can be from dft molecular dynamics so data is coming from experiments like composition processing structure property performance you can refer to publications reports books and all those uh, resources and then slowly you go to data extraction you do some pre-processing to see what is the reliability of the data and whether uh, that's so how you screen the data uh, basically and then finally uh, slowly you reach to prediction and evaluation of the uh, uh, predicted uh, properties and finally you uh, get a new material so you create a knowledge of new material development and knowledge of new material and processes okay so though we know that how the what is the workflow for data driven materials but uh, what is the about the data uh, do we have enough data to do that so for that purpose we should uh, have a look on uh, this part like uh, data when we talk about so we talk about the volume means we need more large amount of data and uh, variety of data we want and the data has to come at a very fast rate so data generation uh, the speed of data generation uh, that matters a lot in this case so uh, i should say that there is more of a no data than a big data problem so big data is not a, not a problem but uh, we do not have data uh, as such why because data available with uh, industry or academicians or uh, any uh, any entity uh, they are not open uh, so open data is required and it should be accessible to people then only we can say that we have big data so whatever even if we have a large amount of data but they are not open and accessible then we can say there is no data availability so efforts are being made to promote accessibility of digital data and uh, you know the materials genome initiative is one of the uh, efforts in this direction and researchers are being encouraged to make their data available to the community and it requires the development of a new big data approaches in materials informatics so uh, we have to devise new ways that how we can uh, use the data available or accessible to us uh, to make a better predictions uh, there are numerous uh, kinds of uh, experimental and uh, simulation based materials property data we have yeah, we do have and these are available and we must use uh, these for our uh, big data uh, analysis uh, one more thing is uh, data though data are available but can we generate data at a faster rate that is a point we have to take care and the high throughput material data generation is one of the ways you know, by which we can generate more and more data but uh, how to do that that we will uh, see in later parts later part of the presentation so uh, what is the experimental research cycle uh, we have so when we do some experiments then we plan it 
We synthesize the material, we process the material, we characterize, then evaluate, and then record it, then see whether the uh, quality is good or not. And then we try to analyze, we interpret the data and all the things. So this is the whole cycle. And if we, after interpretation, we find that the data is not up to the mark, then again we plan and do. So this is a cycle of the experiments. But the point is, this is the traditional way of the uh, research. Now we need to do something more than that uh, by automating uh, different steps we are taking during the uh, uh, during the traditional way of experiments. So automation is one part. Uh, then we need to do that no, do such that things go in parallel. And uh, we have to have machine learning models. Uh, we have to have data repository, repository so uh, uh, people can access that. And we should have active learning and reasoning. So all these things are the accelerators. Accelerators for what? Accelerators for the uh, is for speeding the uh, way the traditional experiment uh, are done. So this will help us in, the, uh, in making or generating faster rate. Uh, so this is the picture uh, which shows uh, the landscape of uh, scientific and automation complexity uh, where you can see uh, here uh, in the bottom, the uh, workflow automation complexity is increasing. And uh, in the y axis, you have uh, work, uh, scientific complexity increases. So, uh, what all these are? So, if uh, a scientist, uh, what he does, uh, if, he, uh, if he is a very good scientist, uh, then uh, this is what uh, we see. The science uh, identify interesting problem. He asks important question and he communicates. Uh, he does experiments, no doubt. And then he communicates the key insights uh, to the people. But it is very slow process. It takes long time. OK, uh, now uh, less complicated is uh, we have a data and we just, uh, for example, my crucial features. Uh, we can identify fail experiments, we choose next experiment. So this is based on data. It's not very complicated and we can uh, go in a cycle and doing this and that. But uh, it's not very intrinsic like a complex uh, uh, process. And the third is uh, a science it can be a minimal things. What we can do is uh, as a scientist is uh, uh, go into automated mode and uh, change the uh, instruments, put new materials, and let the instrument take care of this, and automatically we get larger, larger amount of data. So there are two ways. Uh, scientific complexity, uh, you can increase some uh, scientific complexity, or you can uh, automate the workflow so that you used to get the, you used to get data at a very fast rate, and you analyze the data uh, uh, to reach to some conclusion. So uh, here uh, you can see this is a gray uh, column. Uh, this uh, show the traditional research where you automation is minimum and you used to put more and more effort uh, uh, to increase to solve the complexity of the research. But nowadays uh, there are other ways that you uh, if you can find out uh, the uh, high throughput uh, experiments or uh, computer med mediated uh, experiments, then here you can increase the uh, um, uh, automation. Means, for example, if you have one experiment to do and the comp different compositions and different uh, uh, property evaluation becomes so automatic that you need not to do large amount of uh, scientific work. It will be minimal and you increase the automation. So you will have large amount of data in this. So uh, this is called high throughput experiments you do. 
and once you do that then you are getting a lot of data and this data is fed uh, uh, fed in the computer where you have uh, machine learning or you have materials uh, artificial intelligence you analyze it and then you reach to some conclusion. So you do uh, you are uh, solving a complex system, but uh, but it's not it's going very fast with artificial intelligence or um, machine learning and high support experiments. So what is happening uh, in this case? Uh, this is the automation autom autonomous loop here and you are going to artificial intelligence and then this direction height so protection and finally you target uh, autonomous loop means you are trying to increase increase the predictability and by and the help uh, this predictability is increased due to the automatic automatic uh, uh, evaluation of material and uh, processing of material and generation of data. So in the post foreseeable future, you can expect that if artificial intelligence and machine learning is there along with the height support uh, experiments, then you will be able to solve complex problem very easily and at a faster rate. And uh, this is what uh, has been done in one of the uh, experiments uh, in Germany where they put, uh, they have designed the system of developing materials. They develop small droplets and they solidify at different stages. These are the uh, quench chains. So uh, here droplets can come down. There is a pulse droplet generator here. So it can come down and you can collect the droplets at different stages. Here. So once uh, it is solid, then you can have different cooling rate, different uh, solid fractions, all those things are there. Now that means the composition of a droplet uh, you can change and the processing condition is uh, how much solid fraction is there here or uh, at this place and what is the cooling rate, uh, that all those things you can change. And then you can put, you can mount on a, on a bed and then you can see the microstructure of different particles generated here and they can give rise to different uh, composition, different properties and different functional properties. Those things you can uh, get. But the point is when we talk about automation, here the complexity of automation. So though you are able to generate the material, but how to evaluate it? So you have to have automatic systems where uh, the rate of generation of material is faster as well as the evaluation is also faster. So first of all, you have to go for uh, developing the materials and de developing the systems by which you can automatically generate the descriptors of the material properties. For example, uh, you, for a small droplet, uh, you have to have a system where you can just put a droplet in the hardness, uh, very fast rate you can develop SRD, uh, the phase transformation, uh, you can extrude the material and see the extrudability, uh, you can compress in the behavior of the compressibility or the uh, deformation behavior, electromagnetic properties, electrochemical properties, all the things you can develop, uh, uh, you can measure in a very short time for and also you are able to uh, generate the material at a very faster rate of different compositions. So this is what is called the height support uh, material development uh, which is uh, required. So height support uh, material uh, database generation as well as the uh, uh, machine learning or AI uh, all these things in when combined together, uh, then uh, the uh, rate, the time span of material discovery will reduce. Uh, this is what the uh, message we get. And there are some other uh, high throughput data generation ways. For example, 
you can have you can cast different uh, compositions here and then you can do hot rolling of different composition you can uh, put it together and then homogenize it and then do coil rolling and anneal it and then at different places you can have different compositions you can take those compositions out and see for uh, the properties as we saw in the previous slide so this is a this is called bulk rapid prototyping where you uh, do get uh, uh, bulk material not like a, uh, a small uh, 500 micron uh, particle uh, so this is the one way of uh, doing it but this is a slow process and other is the diffusion multiples you can use for example uh, you have uh, metal a metal b metal c metal d uh, you join them together and see what uh, the mixing zone created here so the composition at different places here will change so you can uh, see the composition you can see the hardness you can see the xrd then it depends upon how automated uh, material evaluation process you have made uh, that is one way and there are other ways also by which uh, you can uh, find out uh, the mixing zones and this in this mixing zone you can uh, see the properties or phases or hardness uh, with composition so that uh, those will be the small uh, descriptors of different composition and hardness and phases all those things uh, that adds to the data what you are uh, able to get and uh, other is uh, the recently developed uh, laser additive manufacturing process you can use uh, here you can see the alloy a alloy b uh, this is powder of one uh, one alloy this is powder of other alloy uh, they are uh, deposited one over the other and then uh, you have gradient you see if you have three alloys you have different gradients you get and the compositional variation also you get here and here you can see the four properties for different compositions and uh, uh, what are the hardness max structure and all those things so the uh, you can do any of them and try to find out the in the correlation between the composition properties and all those uh, descriptors so that you generate a database for the uh, learner who is the learner uh, as a person i am or uh, a computer can learn by itself and give you the uh, prediction what can be done uh, for new material development or process development uh, with this, uh, I think uh, I reach to the conclusion. Uh, to conclude, uh, the span of uh, material discovery to market has markedly decreased, and this has been added by the computational uh, framework we have now, and the data support, uh, as well as the changing business model uh, we are witnessing uh, today and an integ integrated approach for experimentation and computation and simulation is a need of the R for efficient materials and process design, I should say, uh, if we want to grow faster and faster and economically also. And the big data science has been globally recognized as a new paradigm for materials discovery. Uh, and this is going to be one of the major uh, you know, faces uh, in the days to come, uh, it's my belief. And uh, interdisciplinary uh, disciplinary collaborations of materials and computer scientists are vital uh, to enable timely discovery and deployment of advanced materials for the benefit of mankind. Uh, so with this, uh, I thank uh, the avenues of the conference. Thank you.